there is pending the question of whether or not we're to get $24 million in public funds under the Federal Highway Beautification Act, and if we don't come in conformity with that federal act, we will lose $24 million that could be used in our highway system. For that reason, I would call on immediately because we would get much more money from the federal government than we would get or would have to expend in relation to that session. Do you think a special session could get a general appropriations bill out of the way at this time also? I do not know. Wish Kemper told me that he feels this may have been a premeditated plot to embarrass him. At least he hasn't ruled out that possibility. He said that he had received a letter from Dr. Tommy inviting him to be present last evening for a drawing for a place on the May primary ballot. However, when Wish Kemper arrived, he was told that he would not be allowed to draw. He would not be on the ballot for the Texas legislature this May. Wish Kemper said that now he has asked for a written confirmation from Dr. Tommy, denying him a place on the ballot. I asked Dr. Tommy to send me a, a, a legal notification that I was no longer on the ballot. You still have hopes of getting on the ballot? Uh, yes, sir. Well, you met with legal counsel now. What will your next step be? Uh, that we will have to discuss as to which way we will go or what we will do. The man who controls elections in Texas, Secretary of State Bob Bullock, was in Fort Worth today along with Governor Preston Smith. I asked Bullock why the filing fees differ in Tarrant County than those in Hood County, where they do not require filing fees and do not require petitions. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. They should be requiring them uh, for a person to get on the ballot. Uh, Occasionally I hear of an instance like that occurring. Occasionally I hear where a county chairman is, uh, is requiring more than the minimum fee schedule that we set up. Uh, in those cases, we contact them to find out if that's the case. If this is occurring in Hood County, uh, when I get back to Austin, I intend to check in the matter and find out. Dr. Tommy maintains that he has been proceeding according to the directives of Bob Bullock. Other than that, he has not made himself available to the news media for a comment today. But according to Wish Kemper, the whole matter could end up in the courts again. And by the way, it was Wish Kemper who instigated litigation back in 1970, which resulted in the court decisions that the Texas filing fee laws are unconstitutional. Jim Green, Channel 8 News on the Move in Fort Worth. Dallas County Commissioners have been pushing for city-county control of the Dallas Community Action Agency for several years, but now they're taking some action. The commissioners are asking the city of Dallas to join with them in taking control of the Anti-Poverty Agency. Channel 8 News check with the 10 city councilmen to get their reaction to the county proposal. Only two city councilmen, Sheffield Cadane and Doug Fain, were willing to come out in favor of taking over the DCA. A poll of the other city councilmen produced answers such as, I need more time to study the situation, or I think something needs to be done, but I don't know exactly what. One city councilman, Jerry Gilmore, said that he favors continuing the present board because he thinks confrontations at the board meetings between the haves and the have-nots are a healthy situation. Only one other councilman, George Allen, came up with an alternative plan to the county proposal. Whether or not the city accepts the county offer to take over control of the DCA, it's sure that most city and county officials aren't satisfied with the status quo, and the turmoil within the DCA just adds more weight to the county commissioner's side. Martha McIntyre, Channel 8 News on the Move.
Well, Brian, I had a real good uh, winter down there. I was able to throw shortstop and uh, set a new record for most ground balls ever caught in a 60 game schedule. And uh, I was up there in the league and run scored and walks. And uh, I, well, I had a good time down there. Is that the first time you've done that? First time I've ever played uh, in Venezuela. I played winter ball in uh, Florida before this. But I had quite a good experience down there. Uh, Cookie Wilhoff played uh, second base and he helped me quite a lot on the double plays. And we led the league in double plays down there. And uh, Chico Carascal, who had played. Uh, Shortstop with Chicago, and uh, he was a Melly Fox combination there, you know, for a while. He really helped me a lot at shortstop. Why does uh, why did you make the decision to try it this year to, to go into winter ball? Well, I you know I love to play baseball, and the experience is so important for a young ball player. And uh, I had the opportunity to go down there. Richard Billings got me a chance to go, and I went down there with the intentions of uh, trying to improve my game a little bit, and I did. Is there any kind of a cultural disadvantage for you uh, adjusting to a strange country like that? Well, you know, the language barrier is the biggest thing, and the people are really a little different than American people. But overall, you know, uh, they kind of understand. Well, you, a lot of people can speak English, and they do understand you. The food's a little bit weaker than here, but uh, <laughs> you kind of adjust to it after a while, and uh, it's not too shabby. Great. You looking forward to the move? I'm, I'm, it's the greatest thing in the world could ever happen to anyone, you know? No, I mean, I've heard so much about Texas, and I'm really looking forward to going there. I know the people are really supposed to be great, and uh, I just can't wait to go there. I ended up healthy after a little trouble during exhibition season, and uh, heck, it was a lot of fun for me to play without injuries. So I really enjoyed, especially the end of the year and uh, the playoff games. And uh, so I'm looking forward to the first healthy off season, and I think three or four years. So uh, I think it's going to be great for me. And the anticipation that everybody has now is just let's get on with this coming year, you know. Hey, so are you in somewhat of a rush to get to Thousand Oaks this time? Well, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I got a lot of things I want to do in the off season yet, but uh, I think all the guys are looking forward to the off season program and getting back to Thousand Oaks. I don't think that the, uh, just because I'm the only senior that will uh, fare not as well as expected, because the uh, juniors on the team have been around just about as long as I have. We've all been swimming about 10 or 12 years together. So we, we've got a pretty experienced team going up there this year. Would you have to put this one as the highlight of your swimming career to date? Uh, yes, I would, mainly because, you know, being the captain, I'd like to, you know, have SME finish higher than ever. And uh, I'd like to win an NCAA title this year. This is my last chance, and I think I've, this is my best chance, too, I think. Well, you have to uh, show good and be able to move another notch closer to an Olympic swimming berth. Yes, it helps in uh, psyching your competition out because if you've been there once, you know, they're always worrying about you. And the closer you get to the top, the more they're going to worry about you and the greater psychological edge you'll have on them. Do you have a particular event you'd like to finish better in at the NCAAs than any other? Oh, I think my best chance is probably in the 200 freestyle, but. Uh, personally, I'd really like to win the 100 fly because I don't think I'll be swimming against Spitz in the 200 free. He'll probably pass it up to the 200 fly, and uh, to beat him in the 100 fly would be, I think, would be a greater thrill than just winning the 200 freestyle.
Well, I, I think first that it's not a constitutional issue. I think the matter of the death penalty, or whether you should have it or should not have it, is a matter to be determined by the legislature, uh, not by the courts. I think that uh, we will never know whether it's a detriment if people sit on uh, death row for years and years and years and know that they're not going to be executed anyhow. Uh, my feeling about it is that the uh, best uh, detriment uh, or deterrent is the word that's used to crime is that punishment be swift and sure in every instance, whether we apply the death penalty or not. Yes, I do. I think that the, the state should have some uh, leeway in setting up some guidelines. Uh, I believe that they've just about destroyed all the guidelines we've had with our, uh, in support of the state's concern, with our welfare program as an example. And then you've seen the busing come along, and you've seen the ad valorem tax decision in San Antonio. And, and there's been many things like this. It just seems like that the federal, federal courts just continue to uh, take the power of the states away. All we're interested in, I think I speak for each commissioner and all the commissioners' court, that all we're interested in is saying that the people that was intended to get benefits from the poverty program, that they get these benefits. Now, every time they meet, they have problems of uh, discussions. They, they can never carry on a, a, a real good uh, business session, session. It's hard to get people that even want to serve on the board because of all the turmoil. It's just something wrong, and all we're asking is, is to get this thing straightened out so that the people that were really intended to receive the benefits of the program really receive the benefits. The main reason I've been on the board, the DCA board, for going on three years now, and uh, I have noticed in uh, my deliberations in all of these meetings that there's dissension that they're not getting along and apparently that they never will get along and uh, i think the city and county could do a much better job I think uh, a 33-member board uh, is just too cumbersome, it's too large, it's too unwieldy. Uh, I think uh, if we reorganize this board into, say, not more than uh, 21, uh, I believe you'd find that the, 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 that the meetings would go more smoothly, that more business would be accomplished, and actually DCA would be on its way.
I think anyone wondering why uh, Texas Stadium has been chosen by the Dallas Tornado, all you've got to do is look out the window at this magnificent, magnificent facility that certainly uh, if is uh, not surpassed anywhere in the sports world. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why we're here. Uh, we know at this moment that our franchise and interest in professional soccer cannot justify this facility, but there's so much optimism uh, in our minds and in fact uh, for soccer, uh, the growth of it, that we believe that uh, this is the prudent time for us to go ahead and uh, take another step towards first class professional status. The uh, proliferation of amateur soccer teams is the thing that we find most significant and it's really startling to think uh, that we have 843 teams uh, involved in this sport today and that the growth uh, uh, virtually doubles year by year uh, uh, I think almost anyone can see that, that there's a tremendous future in soccer we have seven excellent dates where a field goal will be the top drawing power when our games we play here at Texas Stadium. Can Tornado fans expect basically the same lineup in the uh, team next year? Mm -hmm. uh, I wish our, our coach, he could much better answer this, but uh, basically we'll have the same squad back. I think, you know, everybody's going to be back here getting in shape, uh, starting our weight program uh, next week or the next couple of weeks. And uh, uh, right now we're not in too good a condition, but uh, starting back, we'll get we'll get back in good shape and uh, everybody will be doing good. Hey, what was the purpose of the two-day meeting here at the, at, at the practice field? Well, I feel like it was just to show everybody that, I mean, keep everybody's mind on football and get everybody together and 
let you realize just you know what kind of shape condition you were in up here. It was uh, it proved to me that I'm not in as good a shape as I thought I was in, but uh, it, it's going to you know prepare us to, to start working out again. The ten million dollar bond issue, if passed, will require a tax increase of nine cents per one hundred dollars property valuation. Of that nine cents, five cents will be used to retire the bond debt. The remaining four cents will raise about a half million dollars a year, which will be used to pay for the operating cost of the new transit system. There's little doubt that a new central library is needed. The current facility here at the corner of 9th and Throckmorton Streets was built in 1939. And in the past 33 years, the building has become outdated due to the tremendous growth of the city. Mainly, there is no more room to expand in the existing facility and speaking on both issues of the bond election the chairman of the campaign for passage of the bonds bill Terrault, first cleared the question of where the money is coming from to support the campaign Terrault said no city money is being spent the financing is coming from citizen donations there is a question of what will happen to the current central library building i asked Terrault if it will be abandoned no, it will not. Uh, we'll continue to use that facility. Either it will be added to or a new facility uh, be built next to it or in a location uh, in an area that has been recommended by various library study committees, which will be in the downtown area. This is where your complex of people are, and uh, you need one central large library. So what will happen if the bus bond issue is voted down? Well, there's approximately 18,000 riders daily now on the buses, and uh, we uh, estimate 16,000 might be able to arrange other means of transportation, so at least 2,000 people without transportation, which uh, we can assume many of those folks may have to go on welfare since they can't go to their places of employment and uh, customers can't come downtown to shop. It vitally affects the retail business uh, uh, in Fort Worth. Pardon me, ma'am. Could I talk to you for just a moment? Could I ask you to step right over here? Do you ride the bus often? Uh, yeah, pretty often. Most of the time I have somewhere to go. Do you know there's an election coming up about buses? No, I didn't. Okay, do you know that after April 11th, if you don't vote, there may not be any buses in Fort Worth? Really? What would that do to you if there weren't any? That would mess me up completely. I wouldn't have any way to get to work or back and forth to school now because I'm going to school now, but I'm looking for a job. And uh, when I do get out of school, I won't have any way to find a job if I don't have, if I can't ride the bus. Needless to say, the question which must be asked in these days of pressing traffic problems is not how many people could find cars or other transportation without the bus system, but rather how much more good could a modern, well-equipped bus system accomplish for Fort Worth. Sir Rolf says one bus carrying its capacity of passengers would probably take 40 cars off the streets of the city. His figures indicate that a fully functional public transit system should relieve traffic congestion by between 8 and 10,000 vehicles per day. There are several points to consider here. One of them is that a private owned company, such as the one that runs the buses now, has to make some semblance of a profit to stay in business. The city doesn't have to. The other is you can vote for buses and against libraries or vice versa if you don't want to vote for both. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the Move, Fort Worth. The computer industry is a $20 billion a year business, and in five years, that figure will double. Just as surely as the comic strips tell you the computer is going to take over your home, a good part of that figure is going to involve your home. Just how much was the question we put to the manager of the computer caravan now in Dallas, Patrick J. McGovern of Boston. Well, we see a great part of the growth of the computer industry in the next five years coming in from home-based information services. You'd see about 20 or 25 percent of the industry in five years being based on supplying information to the home. To the housewife, how will the housewife use a computer? Well, for example, we can provide on-demand information services about fashion, about furniture, about food planning, about uh, educational courses, uh, about exercise courses, anything a housewife desires could be specially provided to her and only her on demand through a computer controlled information system. Does the computer threaten the job security of a man who uses his physical prowess now? No, I'm afraid that's one of the uh, great myths of the industry. In fact, where computers have been employed, industry has increased its productivity and increased its total employment. 
Will we ever become a totally computerized society? No, computers can take away a lot of the routine, the dull and boring jobs, but the man will always set the mission, and the computer will really never impact what man wants to do. Okay, so the computer is going to get into your business and into your home, but not by the magnitude that the comic strip characters of Grin and Barrett would have you believe. The computer will become a tool and not a threat to our society. One thing about being a stand-up newsman, I don't have to worry about being replaced by a computer. Apparently, Mother Bon Bon and her newborn baby girl, Lucy, don't have these hang-ups. As is the case with any proud mother, Bon Bon is proud of her offspring, but shies away from strangers she is afraid might hurt her child. Only when I showed her a picture of my newest, Randy, did she get into the swing of things and proceed to show off her newborn. Bon Bon is 11 years old, and this is her first baby. In the cage next door is the new baby's grandmother, Coco. She demonstrated her pride at the showing of her grandbaby, Apparently it was Coco that was responsible for Bon Bon's love toward the little one, for it was Coco that held Bon Bon close 11 years ago, the first time in the history of the zoo that any chimp had shown any interest in an offspring. Meanwhile, on the other side of mother and daughter was Toby, the father, a college man as he's called because he was born at Tulane University. Toby wanted to make sure everyone knew the baby was his too. Continuing down the family tree, Lucy's half-brother is Charlie Brown, who seemed so much more interested in playing with his gorilla friend Bimbo and trying to find out just what makes the camera tick. But of Lucy herself, well, as it is with any star, these publicity sessions can be so tiring, and after all, she must have her beauty rest. Jerry Park, Channel 8 News, on the move at the Dallas Zoo.